Hello, welcome uh, to this first session after, after the keynote here, and we'll go straight into it. Um, it's my pleasure to um, welcome you to our Spring Framework Strategy session. It's a bit of a uh, specifically focused uh, presentation where we highlight uh, some recent initiatives, current initiatives, initiatives that we see ourselves working on uh, next year. So it's very much uh, um, timed to the Spring Framework 6.1 release, which is uh, coming right in November very soon, and already giving a bit of a forecast to what's coming next. Um, so, uh, myself, I'm Jürgen Höller, I'm the Spring Framework project lead, um, basically speaking right out of my, out of, uh, my everyday work here. And right next to me... Uh, Sébastien Deleuze, I'm a core framework uh, developer, and uh, I will talk more about runtime efficiency later. And you're the owner of quite a few of the topics that we, uh, we talk about here, one of the main contributors to the, to the actual effort. All right, thanks, Sebastian, so far. Um, I'll take it from here for a start. So um, let's, let's just spend a, a minute on actually our own anniversary. DevOx has an anniversary edition, the 20th edition. We have an anniversary year as we, we tend to see it. The uh, Spring Framework project um, got uh, set up in February 2003, had its first pre-release in June 2003, so we consider it 20 years old from that perspective. The 1.OGA release was then in March uh, 2004, so um, just a couple of months and it's actually going to be production ready for 20 years. Um, not only that, to me personally, even more surprising, the Spring Boot project is 10 years old already. It got set up in 2013. It got its first release in, in a first production release in early 2014. So it's approaching its 10th production anniversary as well very soon now. So uh, that's quite an anniversary year. I've seen many um, open source projects, many infrastructure efforts in the Java space come and go over those years. So I've been serving as the uh, um, um, project lead and release manager of the core framework project ever since its inception. So basically it's a very personal anniversary those 20 years. Um, and uh, I'm very happy to see that the Spring Boot project, which I still feel is kind of the, the new kid on the block, which it isn't of course anymore, it's a very established part of the ecosystem. Um, and I, I'm very happy to see the 10th anniversary of that um, this year as well. All right. Um, <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so, um, the, uh, let, let's, go, let's get right into where we are. Um, I, I'm not very nostalgic, so I tend not to spend too much time um, looking towards the past. Um, so, fast forward to the present. We have a, uh, uh, a current new generation of the framework already. Um, it's out for almost a year now. It's the Spring Framework 6.0 generation, 6.0x generation. Uh, with the initial Spring Boot 3.0 release going with it. In the meantime, there's a Spring Boot 3.1 release because the core framework does a feature release once a year. The uh, Spring Boot um, uh, arrangement does uh, two feature releases every year. So every core framework release has two Spring Boot releases on top of it. So uh, the current state of the art is the Spring Boot 3.1 release uh, dating back to May this year. There's a couple of very important steps that we took in uh, the Spring Framework 6 generation. And uh, maybe the, the, most, the most, most radical one is uh, the baseline upgrade. We raised the baseline to JDK 17, and at the same time, we uh, made the switch to the Jakarta namespaced versions of uh, the former Java EE APIs. So uh, the servlet APIs, JPA, uh, Bean validation, we all use them in their Jakarta dot uh, incarnations now. Um, it's uh, technically a Jakarta E9 baseline, it's effectively a Jakarta E10 baseline, in particular in Spring Boot, where we present these, these latest um, editions of those APIs. Um, Jakarta E9 was just a namespace change, so the interesting part came in 10. All right. This is going to be with us for the entire Spring Framework 6.x generation. So this is, uh, we always tend to set generational baselines. Uh, all the feature releases, all the 6.x releases are going to adhere to that baseline. The most important development effort, probably one of the most extensive development initiatives we, we ever had, 
um, in the past couple of years was our ahead of time processing um, with the the immediate goal of uh, preparing a spring-based application, a spring-based setup for native image deployment. So the, these, this initiative, Spring AOT, um, and uh, the build arrangement for GraalVM native images has been long in the works and uh, has been released in Spring Framework 6 and Spring Boot 3. And it's, of course, a, an ongoing effort to, con to refine and uh, and uh, update this along with uh, uh, the infrastructure. So we very much co-evolve with uh, the JVM and GraalVM there. This presents an alternative deployment arrangement. Um, so instead of traditional hotspot, classic hotspot deployment, uh, we allow spring-based applications to be set up for native image deployment now. Certain constraints coming with it. This is a topic that we're going to focus on in the second half um, of uh, this session. So um, the groundwork is in Spring Framework 6 and Spring Boot 3 in the .o releases already. Another major theme, uh, not the focus for this session today, but uh, uh, quickly mentioning, uh, we have a fresh approach to observability. So we actually report metrics and tracing across the portfolio, across the entire stack through Micrometer now. Uh, so it's a very different approach to how we've uh, um, addressed observability before. It's now a core part of the framework. It's a core part of every spring uh, portfolio project. So uh, we baked observability, we baked metrics and tracing in a consistent uh, fashion uh, right into the uh, foundational framework. All right, um, so that's kind of initial steps in all brevity. Um, we're not doing a, um, a, a what's new here, rather a selected highlights kind of uh, uh, um, uh, list of uh, uh, things we worked on. So we're currently working towards the Spring Framework 6.1 release. Spring Framework 6.1 coming up in November, Spring Boot 3.2 going with it um, for, as the first Spring Boot release on, on this generation of the core framework, aiming for a, a mid-November general availability. And uh, as, we, as we usually see these feature releases, they continue on the themes. Um, they take the themes forward that we established for the Spring Framework 6 generation. We have a Java 17 baseline, um, but the whole, the whole point of raising the minimum version to Java 17 was always that we knew that Java 21 was coming. So uh, the general goal is that there are two LTS generations of Java to choose from for every Spring Framework generation, a minimum of two LTS generations. So we were a little early with the Java 17 baseline race. Right now, it manifests itself right as we want to have it. You have a choice of Java 17 and Java 21, two LTS generations of Java for your Spring Framework 6 based applications. And in Spring Framework 6.1, we do everything we can to uh, embrace and align with JDK 21 in all parts of the framework. Um, technically, you can also run Spring Framework 5.3x and 6.0x applications up until JDK 21. It's part of the support range. But in Spring Framework 6.1, we uh, go right into it with first-class support for new JDK 21 features. And of course, the uh, most important effort there is virtual threats, embracing virtual threats, configuration facilities for virtual threats. We have um, virtual threat modes now in, in our simple async task executor, simple async task scheduler. We have a corresponding setup in Spring Boot, where through a simple um, configuration flag, we're basically opting into virtual threats by default. You get not only a virtual threats configured Tomcat or a virtual threats configured Jetty embedded there in Boot, you also get the Spring scheduling facilities and task execution facilities set up for virtual threats by default. So uh, a lot of these efforts are uh, part of the Spring Framework 6.1 umbrella. And uh, the most important defect there is um, a new degree of scalability for Spring MVC. Uh, it's, it's, it's a perfect fit. If you, uh, if you look at it from that perspective, a uh, traditional servlet-based web stack um, running with a thread pool traditionally is just a perfect candidate, at least as to evaluate a setup with virtual threads and uh, to see how far you can take it from there. And, uh, and what kind of benefit you get, what kind of footprint reduction, what kind of higher degree of scalability. All that's needed to empower you to uh, embrace virtual threats, to try virtual threats in anger, is there now in Spring Framework 6.1 and with first-class configuration support in Spring Boot 3.2. 
Another major theme, continuing on our runtime efficiency theme, um, we have in 6.1, we have uh, support for JVM checkpoint restoring, uh, also known as Project Crack, coordinate it, restore a checkpoint. We call the feature JVM checkpoint restore because that's, that's what it is. You bootstrap a hotspot JVM, you, 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 you start it up, potentially you warm it up, and you take a snapshot. Um, and for further bootstrapping of the same service, of the very same um, application, you can restore from that very checkpoint that you took. Um, restore from that snapshot and immediately jump into a warmed up process. This is also um, a topic we're going to focus on in the second half, when we do a bit of a deeper dive into our runtime efficiency theme. There's interesting impact that all of these things, all of these infrastructure initiatives have on our core framework, on our programming model to some degree, but in particular on core framework behavior and core, core framework assumptions. So inspired by checkpoint restoring, where we need to um, uh, stop with the activity uh, in the application where we have to let go of any resources that we hold, close the network sockets, close the file handle so that we're ready to take a, a checkpoint. Inspired by this, we decided to revisit our lifecycle management. Ever since Spring Framework 3.0, we have a pretty sophisticated lifecycle model for, for beans managed by Spring Application Context. And that's exactly what we, what we um, decided to revisit. There's a bit of a strengthened model there now. So components implementing the Spring Lifecycle or Smart Lifecycle interfaces, uh, they automatically participate in the checkpoint restore arrangement. We perform a full stop of the application context before we take a checkpoint, before crack, before the JVM tries to take a checkpoint. And uh, we, we do a restart of the components that we stopped previously. We do a restart when uh, we restore from that snapshot. So that's, uh, uh, there's quite a bit of tightening behind this. And you might notice, as you dive into the Spring Framework 6.1 um, uh, revision, you might notice that we actually implement lifecycling quite a few further places. So we have stop-restart behavior all across the board now. Um, task schedulers participating in stopping and restarting, uh, uh, connection pools that we control, resource holding components that we control, uh, they consistently support this lifecycle management now which is totally beneficial, can be beneficial outside of the context of checkpoint restoring. You can just take a Spring application context anywhere on any JVM, just call stop on the application context, and there will be consistent behavior following from that. Very useful for checkpoint restoring, but can be useful for other scenarios as well, for reconfiguration attempts, for test scenarios, for as you see, please, right? We, we design those features as general features inspired by the infrastructure need that we encounter. All right, fast forwarding a bit, uh, we have uh, a, uh, another revision um, that goes along with all of this, uh, with virtual threads to some degree, um, we revisited our reactive infrastructure. So vir virtual threads re-empower Spring MVC, a lean servlet stack. Basically no reactive components in that stack, right? Um, but there's other variants of the Spring stack. There might be a servlet stack, a Spring MVC stack, with a little bit use of reactive. Some Spring MVC controllers returning reactive types, for example. Some MVC controllers interacting with services underneath that have a reactive design in their API. Or a fully reactive, a pure Webflux server stack. All of these benefit from consistent reactive support across the programming model, across the framework, and there were a few gaps. So um, we have, for example, a uh, cache SPI now that is able to perform asynchronous caching as a backend behind reactive types, reactive signatures annotated with add cacheable. We do the same for completable future. Uh, many of the SPIs are actually completable future based underneath. Um, we support scheduling methods. An add scheduled method returning a reactor mono or returning a completable future can now be part of the scheduling arrangement. They don't have to be void. Um, along with this goes Kotlin coroutine support, where we also closed a few gaps in this 6.1 release, uh, in particular in the AOP space. So there's a consistent experience now and consistent support as far as uh, we can take it for reactive programming for the use of Kotlin coroutines across the framework. 
in the very same generation, the very same release that also brings consistent virtual thread support. So it's your choice. A lean virtual thread stack without any reactive streams, any project reactor is, is, a, is kind of the sort of mainstream, um, the evolution of the mainstream MVC stack in, in Springland. And in uh, reactive programming, there are quite a few new facilities as well to take existing use of reactive um, features forward and also to um, be a part of uh, selective use of reactive programming wherever you see fit, even in a Spring MVC based stack. All right, uh, another um, theme in, the, in a different area that we meant to address for the longest time is revisiting our data binding and validation facilities. Quite a few of them were um, sort of independent features. The interaction of those features wasn't always very obvious. So there's a bit of more of a consistent experience there now. For example, we perform uh, the, the validation of handler method parameters in Spring MVC through a consistent model now, not through um, the uh, general post-processing that we had there before. So it's, it's baked into the dispatching facilities. There's a more direct interaction there and the more consistent interaction with other validation steps uh, that we perform. Um, there's also new features in data binding in general. Uh, like quite, a, quite a bit of this has actually been um, shipped in, in past feature releases. So support for constructor-based binding, support for records, support for records basically everywhere. Uh, and then support for bean validation annotations in places where they haven't been supported before. So uh, it really comes together now in 6.1. That's why it forms a theme that I'm happy to see in this generation as well. Um, another kind of uh, uh, inspired uh, feature is revisiting our, our web client APIs, our client-side HTTP support. Uh, we went into, into this a bit more uh, deeply on, on, on Monday in our deep dive session. Uh, in a nutshell, this is inspired by virtual threads to some degree, by a consistent programming model experience in a lean virtual threads oriented stack, um, where you want a modern API experience, so not using REST template, which really shows its age to some degree, but rather using a fresh, modern, fluent API for it. We had that for Reactive. We had that as part of the Webflux stack, the web client API, a fluent API. Um, so we kind of took that API design, and it has now a, an equivalent in uh, the general Spring Web module called REST client, running on the REST template infrastructure. So it uses the same infrastructure, the same SPIs, the same conversion facilities um, underneath. But it has a web client-like fluent API uh, where you express your, your interaction. Uh, a, a perfect match for a Spring MVC stack. Um, in particular for virtual threads, where this is a blocking API participating in, uh, in the virtual thread arrangement, as you would expect. And there's no need to bring um, React or Reactive Streams in just for the purpose um, of a modern web client experience. So that's why we introduced REST client. And uh, last but not least, we also have a, uh, um, new, a new design, a new API design, uh, basically, on top of JDBC template, the name parameter JDBC template, called JDBC client. Um, so this is also inspired a bit by our um, reactive theme next to the virtual threads theme, uh, feature parity, API alignments between the two uh, programming models. JDBC template, of course, is also um, following a, uh, a design model from, from earlier times, many overloaded methods. Uh, it had named parameter support in a separate class named parameter JDBC template. Um, so it was always a bit, bit of a historic arrangement of why it got there. JDBC client now is a fluent API, um, combines positional and name parameter support, and has all the common JDBC interaction features for querying and updating in, in as, as part of a unified API. Um, Everything else is basically JDBC template based. You just create it from a, a JDBC data source and it goes straight from there. So for a consistent programming model, for consistent readability throughout your, um, throughout your code base, uh, this is a, I'll say a fine part to have next to REST client, next to other fluent style APIs that you may be using already. So that's also new in 6.1. All right, um, a quick glance forward 
there's uh, Spring Framework 6.2 already kind of uh, in, at least in its planning stages uh, for a release next year in a year's time. So we are really going ahead of ourselves a bit here. Um, we are going to pick up Jakarta EE 11. Uh, that's going to be released in the meantime, mid next year, with uh, a servlet 6.1 release, in particular JPA 3.2, which brings quite a few new interesting features our way. Uh, so we intend to pick those up and uh, make them a first class part of a, uh, a spring based stack when we actually run on uh, containers on providers that support those new API levels, you will be seamlessly able to use those new API facilities as we, we always do it. The baseline remains at 9. Um, many, many stacks are going to stay at uh, Jakarta E10 for the time being, but if you're ready to upgrade, um, then our Jakarta E11 support will be there for you. We are going to uh, spend um, further time on Project Leiden, the uh, uh, initiative in OpenJDK for faster bootstrapping on Hotspot is kind of a, a, a nice complementary effort, a nice continuation of our efficiency team. More on this very soon in the second half. And uh, as part of this, inspired by um, um, the, the role that Spring AOT can have in all of those efficiency scenarios, in all of those deployment scenarios, so not only for native images, but also for Project Crack, where Spring AOT processing makes a lot of sense, and for Project Leiden, where AOT processing um, makes a lot of sense, provides a, li a lot of additional benefit. Um, so along with this, we're going to revisit AOT on the JVM as a, as a first class scenario. So not just AOT for native image processing as the primary channel, but sort of an equivalent first class arrangement for AOT on, on hotspot usage. All right, with so much said, um, I'd like to welcome Sebastian back onto the stage for a deep dive into our runtime efficiency team. Sebastian, the stage is yours. Thanks, Thanks. again. <coughs> so, hello everybody, I am Sebastian Dolos, and I'm going to talk about runtime efficiency, which, i which is one of my favorite topics. I have been working on some experimental Spring projects like SpringFoo. I have been leading the Spring Native Experimental Project that has now materialized as a native support in Spring Boot 3. So we are going to cover various ways to uh, allow you to improve the runtime efficiency of your uh, existing and new Spring Boot applications. But first, let's talk about what do we care about runtime efficiency. I think the, the, the first goal is to uh, do cost optimization of your running application, either on-premise or on the cloud. Of course, if you are using less CPU, less memory, less resources, that provides a better sustainability for your workload, which really matters these days. And I think we also want to make the JVM a good Kubernetes citizen because, well, the JVM has a pretty long startup time, uh, warm-up uh, time as well, and memory consumption is sometimes a bit challenging. So. We, we can probably make things better here. So how are we going to do that? Um, we all love new technologies, so of course we are going to use new technologies and I'm going to share more about GraalVM, Crack and other related uh, topics. But it's not so. We are also um, uh, leveraging the, the great feedback we have from the Spring community to know what is of interest for you. We are listening carefully feedback and after this talk, we really welcome any kind of feedback on the various ways you prefer to uh, improve the runtime efficiency. We are also doing a lot of industry collaboration with various sectors like the Oracle team, Java platform team, GraalVM, Azure, Bellsoft, etc. But we want to clearly define the goals. What are the customer outcomes? What are the benefits you gain? Because we are not here to just focus on the absolute low level uh, numbers, uh, it's important to identify the trade-off. And today, I will try to share with you the advantages of each solution, but also to share um, basically the drawbacks, the trade-offs that are involved, because it's up to you to choose if that matters for your um, uh, context or not. So we are going to talk about two ways to scale to zero your Spring application with subsequent startup. The use cases uh, are, there is many use cases, so you we are all using the JVM to uh, create some uh, high-performance public websites that uh, can handle a lot of workloads. But let's be honest, we are also building a lot of back offices that are used half of the time or less. 
We have staging environment that does not require to be up all the time. We have microservices where there is some catching, which could allow to shut down some instances. And for just high availability, we need to have two instances of, uh, uh, for one service because, yeah, uh, the long startup time requires to, in case of an issue, have multiple instances. So the global goal is to basically avoid to waste uh, resources and optimize that. I see scale to zero as a kind of generalization of serverless. It can allow you to deploy your workloads, not only on Amazon Lambda, but on any Kubernetes or cloud platforms that is scaling to zero container, and there is more and more these days. You are not limited to function. It can support any kind of programming model, uh, including the traditional web application that you potentially are developing. So the goal is to increase the scope we can target to improve the runtime efficiency without forcing some specific programming model and to allow you to um, basically leverage a pay-as-you-use building model to optimize everything. So it's not only a technical thing, it's also about changing the building model you are using for your applications. The first way uh, to scale to zero is with Spring Boot and GraalVM native images. And I had the pleasure to lead the Spring native experimental project about that. Uh, as said by Jürgen, as of Spring Boot 3.0, we are providing a first-class and production-ready support for compiling Spring Boot application with GraalVM. Um, the use case, the main use case is pretty simple. You want to create the most optimized container image to be deployed in production. So for that, you may leverage, for example, the build pack capabilities uh, in order to create from your Spring Boot application an optimized container image, uh, leveraging a base layer of a very small uh, operating system mainly OpenSSL, GDPC, and a few libs. And on top of that, you will have a native executable uh, from your Spring Boot application, no OpenJDK distribution required. Uh, this will all leverage the Spring ahead of time optimization and transformation that we have been working on. And in practice, that allows you to start your Spring Boot application in a few dozens of milliseconds, including on production. So the few dozens of milliseconds is achievable on, on, on one or two uh, CPU chip servers. We are going to share some data points on production just a bit later. So GraalVM uh, has a lot of advantages. In addition to the, the instant startup, you have peak performance available immediately, low resource usage, especially memory, reduce surface attack because you have less dynamicity, so you can't load a new class uh, with a magic trick, and you have compact packaging. But I said I will be explicit about the trade-off. Um, uh, GraalVM has a few trade-offs and drawbacks. The first one is a very slow compilation. So your, uh, your application will compile in minutes inste instead of seconds. So you are not going to use GraalVM to improve your developer experience. Instead, that's the opposite. You are going to continue to develop with the GVM, and the, the compilation to a native image is a kind of optimization for your deployment, uh, 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 your uh, deployment with container image. There is also another issue, which is the compatibility, because um, GraalVM native image is almost like the regular Java behavior, but is going to do a static analysis of your application from the main method, and is going to analyze with a pretty fine grain, uh, um, uh, basically uh, field by field, method by method, what part of your application is used to only compile this very strict subset to native, okay, to get everything efficient. And so with dynamic aspect of the, the GVM, so the reflection, resource loading, proxies, etc., they need to be specified explicitly in order to be taken in account by the, the GraalVM native image compiler. Spring is going, Spring IoT is going to infer a lot of those ints and metadata, but for a few subsets, uh, a small subset, and typically what is specific to your application, you are going to explicitly specify a few ints. That means you need an additional effort to specify a few things to make your application compilable to native. And the last point is the closed world assumption because uh, with the combination of the Spring IoT optimization and GraalVM native image, you are going to freeze more uh, settings, configuration at build time. Uh, that does not mean you can change nothing. You can change your database password and your database URL, for example, but you can't basically introduce new bins and change the structure of your, your application. So you are not going basically to switch at runtime of database type, for example. Historically, there was a fourth uh, issue and drawback with native, which was lower performance. 
But that's not necessarily true anymore, so we are going to see more data points about that a bit later. The second way to scale to zero with Spring Boot and uh, Project Crack is something that we are introducing right now, so that may be pretty new to you. The goal is, uh, as explained by Jürgen before, you are going to start your application as usual, but at some point, you are going to trigger a checkpoint that is going to serialize the memory representation of your JVM on disk. Okay, this is a snapshot. And then later, potentially on another server, which has si is similar operating system and CPU archi architecture, you are going to restore your application, resume its execution with a very, very fast uh, restoration time. And interestingly, we have, when we have begun to work on that with Jürgen, we, we found that uh, Checkpoint and Restore are a very good match with Spring Lifecycle, uh, Stop uh, and Start Phases. And so what we have done in Spring Framework 6.1, we have just mapped basically uh, Lifecycle Start with Checkpoint, Lifecycle Stop with Restore. And instead of just supporting Start and Stop, regular Lifecycle that you may use on production, we are going to support sta Start, stop, restart, stop, restart, stop, restart, stop, okay? So we are going to support multiple cycles of stopping and restarting your application in order to support crack. Uh, when we are talking about what that means to add support for crack, in order to be able to checkpoint your application, you need to close the sockets, the file, the thread pool, etc. So when we are working on adding support for some GDBC driver or something like that, we are taking care of closing the resources before checkpoint and recreating those resources after the restore. Spring Boot 3.2 introduces initial support for GVM checkpoint restore with Project Quack. We are pretty happy and proud of the scope of the support. I think it's, it has good quality, but we are also planning some further improvement in later version. This is why we call it initial support and also the ecosystem needs to evolve a bit to support everything because we are not in control of the whole ecosystem. Some libraries need to be uh, improved in order to allow to recreate the resources because we are all used to just start and stop our application, uh, create and destroy. So here we need more, more facilities. If you go to the Spring Checkpoint Restore Smoke Test, that's a pretty long name, but uh, <laughs> uh, project, you will see basically the up-to-date status of uh, the part of the ecosystem that we support out of the box. That means that if you are using Spring MVC with Tomcat, Spring Webflux with Netty, uh, Spring Data GDBC, Spring uh, GPA or Web Client, uh, this will be supported out of the box uh, with Crack. We have already taken care of closing properly the resources and recreating them. Of course, like I said, we are going to continue to increase that scope and you are not blocked if something is not uh, supported you can yourself basically um, yeah, provide the lifecycle management to clean up and recreate the resources. This is what works out of the box. So uh, we are going, thanks to the Spring Boot Freeder 2 support for Crack, uh, uh, to scale to zero with the GVM, which is a pretty new thing. So um, basically, that will require a bit of work for integrating that on your side, because on your CI CD platform, typically, you are going to start your application uh, ahead of time, potentially uh, trigger some, some load testing in order to make your JVM warm, then create this checkpoint, and uh, then basically uh, you can create a ready to restore container image, or you can directly create uh, the, the checkpoint on your Kubernetes platform. You will be able to restore your application, so here we have the figure, in 50 milliseconds uh, uh, on production, so it's as fast as native, okay? This is the same order of magnitude. You can restore a Spring Boot 3.2 application with Crack in a dozens of milliseconds, including on small servers. So that scale uh, in that regard. So the advantages of the project Crack support in Spring Boot are a bit like the native support, instant startup and peak performance immediately, with the big advantage that we are still on the GVM with all the regular capabilities, so you don't have ins, metadata, etc. But, of course, there are drawbacks uh, and trade-offs. So the first um, trade-off is that you need to start your application ahead of time. So that raises a few non-trivial questions. Uh, do you want to start your application on your CI CD platform with a production configuration or not? Okay. Um, yeah, you, you need to handle that. 
There is also the life cycle and management I, I, I talk about. So Spring Boot is going to take care about the maximum of the life cycle management for the supported technologies. But if, if in your code you are opening directly sockets, uh, if you are uh, basically opening files, etc., you may require a bit of life cycle management to properly close the resources during the checkpoint and reopen the resources uh, during the restoration. Secret management, I think this is uh, the most important point for me and the main constraints right now. When you are going to create the checkpoint, in the files that will be created, there will be everything in memory, including the password, etc. So, uh, whatever configuration you provide uh, before the checkpoint, you can expect to find this info information secret included inside uh, the, uh, the snapshot files. In order to solve that, um, that issue, there is, I think, yeah, multiple ways to handle that. Either you deploy your container in a very private, secured um, repository with the right level of security for those secrets. But more often, you will just want to avoid totally that because that's not okay for your company in terms of security. So either you can directly create the checkpoint in your Kubernetes platform and store it in an encrypted uh, volume, for example, with the right level of performance or you can basically uh, perform a configuration update after the restoration. So here the principle would be you start your application and create the checkpoint with some fake database, no password uh, uh, for you, from your production, and then after the restoration, uh, you basically update your configuration to use your, your production stuff. I'm going to show how you can do that with Spring. The last trade-off is that Crack is Linux only. So for production, that's not necessarily a big issue because, well, we are mostly running workloads on Linux. But in terms of developer experience, we may have to uh, add some Docker, uh, Docker container to deal with the developer experience on Windows and Mac, this kind of constraints. And if you are deploying on uh, Kubernetes, for example, you will have to set uh, carefully a, a set of Linux capabilities to be able to deploy that without the privilege mode, which is a no-go for any serious production deployment, I think. Uh, so there is a selected set of Linux capabilities that you can set to have the right to create the checkpoint or restore your application. Um, when I talk about initial support, this is because we are planning further um, refinement, especially for this post-restoration configuration update. But nowadays, you can uh, basically, with Spring Cloud Context and at Refresh Scope, we provide some capabilities to change at runtime the configuration of some bins. You can potentially um, do what I said before, start your application with some fake database, and after restore, you are using at refresh scope to basically update the configuration of your database with the production password and URL, etc. Uh, Olga from the Spring Cloud team has provided an, exa an example here, and there is Quack support in Spring Cloud Config and Spring Cloud Context uh, in the upcoming release that are coming. So let's now see a few data points. Pet Clinic startup time uh, in seconds, you can see that both GraalVM and Quack allow almost instant startup, dozens of milliseconds, um, 50 times faster startup than the regular GVM, including, here this is figures for on very, very cheap server, okay? One CPU, two gigabytes, or two CPU, four gigabytes, that's very small workload. So here we can say that both GraalVM and Quackalo to scale to zero for real. Then we have the memory consumption. So here, uh, let's be uh, clear, the crack enable GDK that you will need to run a checkpoint restore is still a GDK, still a GVM, so you, you will still need the same amount of memory. So here, only GraalVM native images allow to divide by three uh, the memory used by your, your GVM plus Spring Boot infrastructure, uh, uh, GVM infrastructure mostly, uh, so that's something to keep in mind. Let's now talk about the performances. So here we have the a diagram that shows uh, basically the throughput, uh, and we are basically load testing our endpoint to uh, make your GVM warm. So the blue line is a regular GVM that, that as you could expect, takes some time to be warm up, okay? So take a few seconds, a few minutes to be warm up. No, no surprise here. The yellow line is GraalVM Community Edition that provides a pretty stable throughput because there is not just in time uh, compilation, everything has, has been done ahead of time, but also provide a low, lower level of performance. Okay? GraalVM Community Edition is lower than the, the GVM with its JIT optimization. 
something a bit new, the Oracle GraalVM, which is the new name of GraalVM Enterprise Edition. It's now available for free with a similar li license than Oracle GDK, with some constraints, like you can't sell some native executable of container images created wi with it. So I'm not a lawyer, so check the license, please. But basically, you can begin to use Oracle GraalVM for free right now to, to uh, compile your, your Spring Boot application. And interestingly, it's still a bit slower than the peak performance of a GVM uh, after being fully warm up, but it's pretty close even without profile guided optimization. So the argument to say native image is always slower than a fully warm up GVM, it's not always true because there is more CPU budget and more time to do the optimization ahead of time. And that allows GraalVM native image to compensate a bit the fact that there is no dynamic optimization with the JIT. Uh, yeah, so, so check it out. And crack allow, so here we are basically running a, a previously warm uh, instance uh, before creating the checkpoint. You can see that we can start with a pretty good level of warmness and uh, that's uh, interesting. Now, um, let's talk about something else. Both crack and GraalVM allow to scale to zero, almost instant startup with some significant constraints. Okay, it's not a free lunch, especially pet clinic is a thing, your application with all its complexity, with all the libraries, with all your context, I know it is not the same story, so uh, yeah, I know the constraints. So what if we could have a solution to maybe not get as much as benefits as Crack uh, and um, uh, GraalVM, but still provide a very good way to improve uh, the runtime characteristic of your GVM and Spring Boot workloads. Like we said uh, uh, before, Spring Ahead of Time optimization has been originally created for the GraalVM native support of Spring Boot, okay? No real focus has been done on the GVM use case, but as a side effect, mainly because we are creating, we are pre-computing the Spring Boot conditions and creating uh, a Lambda-based version of your application with less reflection involved. We have experience about that uh, on Spring Foo and various other projects. We know that's faster, okay? And so Spring IoT optimization right now allows to start your Spring Boot application on the GVM with a 15% uh, faster startup time. And I highly encourage you to go to the efficient deployment section of the Spring Boot documentation. It's a new section we have uh, modified uh, recently that will provide you all the details to run your Spring Boot application in exploded mode because that's faster and consume less memory and how you can enable the IoT mode on your existing Spring Boot free application right now. Project Layden, as presented by Brian Gutz before, introduces uh, experimental pre-main optimizations basically class data sharing plus AOT caches on steroids to reduce the startup and warm up time on the GVM. And interestingly, there is a very nice synergy between Spring IoT optimization and project laden in order to allow um, from 2x to 4x faster startup time with very little trade-off. And here, uh, I like to do that measure data points on production because this is what matters, not really on big and powerful MacBook M2 Pro like that. And so you can see that on very cheap servers, the, the, the very same one CPU, two gigabyte servers, or two CPU and four gigabyte, you can see that um, both using both Spring IoT and Project Layden optimization uh, provide a very significant boost in terms of startup time. Uh, big warning, this is the early days, everything experimental. Uh, Project Layden pre-main optimization are going to evolve, and IoT as well. Uh, so, um, yeah, there is room for improvements, there is various pain points to solve, but I think this, uh, this, has, potentially the, 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 this has the potential to be mainstream because uh, there is low constraints and it allows 2x to 4x reduction of the startup time. So we can't scale to zero, we can't have subsequent startup, but we can largely improve the characteristic of the runtime. So we are starting a collaboration between the Java platform and Spring Teams on Project Layden, Spring IoT, and those topics. I guess we will share more later, but it's interesting to see that we are working together to see how we can um, make this synergy reaching the, the next level and see how far we can push the boundaries. I'm going to let the mic for uh, Jürgen for the yeah. closing words. Sort of the mic <laughs> yeah. and the clicker. Um, OK. Um, just a couple of minutes left. Let's um, wrap it up from here. So uh, the, uh, back to the uh, uh, topic of JDK 21 and virtual threats for a moment. Um, 
the, the fit with Spring MVC on the servlet stack on Tomcat, uh, typically in a typical Spring Boot uh, web setup, um, is, is very obvious, very immediate. Um, Spring Boot 3.2 therefore comes with uh, first class support for this. We totally see mainstream potential this, um, with a Spring MVC, Spring Boot uh, web stack on JDK 21. Uh, we definitely recommend exploring virtual threads and what they can do for you. And if uh, the ecosystem, all the JDBC drivers, if they uh, remove the uh, remaining glitches that there might be with some internal synchronization that holds you back from getting the full benefit of virtual threads, uh, that might be the case with a couple of components that you're using. But fast forward by half a year, a year, um, we expect those remaining issues in the corresponding drivers and the corresponding libraries to have been fully resolved um, in order to, for you to be able to get the full benefit out of virtual threads in such a setup. And uh, with uh, the fast startup um, topic, um, we've already explored this, uh, Sebastian explored it in, 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 in more detail. There's a strong synergy with our Spring AOT efforts. We expect to continue along those lines, in particular the Project LIDAR numbers. They, those are really early numbers. It's basically the current prototype of the LIDAR branch of OpenJDK. Um, there's certainly further way to go, further room for improvement, further room for synergies. Um, Spring AOT to some degree is a, a sort of condenser, it's a term that Project Lightning uses, a step that you perform after compilation in order to lock down certain assumptions a bit more, uh, make some further stronger assumptions, produce a tighter outcome that is a better input for the next step of your build. That's exactly what Spring AOT is. It turns your Spring configuration into a tighter representation, into a class-based representation. Uh, where everything from class path scanning to class resolution, a condi a condition evaluation, all of this happened. Uh, and we have a, uh, a tighter representation that we then can use for native image deployment for Project Rack, for Project Leiden deployments. So uh, the goal on our end is a choice of runtime efficiency options. Your mileage may vary. You may be able to use you may be able to use GraalVM native images. You may want to use GraalVM native images. Um, then that is certainly a path totally worth exploring. For a given, in particular, existing application, a large-scale existing application, you might not want to go that way. You might not be able to go that way in the near future at all. Uh, then there are other options. You may choose to evaluate what Project Crack can do for you in particular for existing applications that you modernize, where you upgrade to a newer JVM, a newer Spring Framework generations, and now those, those capabilities in the JVM, in the framework, become available to you at, at, at a, a rather low cost, right? They, they are part of the offering. They don't require changes to your application code. There's no changes in the programming model in most degrees. It's the same application, hardly any changes to the code base. Ideally, no changes to the code base at all, and you can get better runtime performance out of it. We generally recommend a JVM upgrade for that very reason. You basically get better performance for free. Just upgrade the JVM underneath um, your, your Spring-based application. Please upgrade the Spring Framework and Spring Boot versions with it, uh, and you'll get better performance for the same application out of the box. But these facilities, Project Crack, for example, uh, what Project Leiden uh, intends to deliver, all of these could provide a dramatic performance improvement for certain char characteristics like startup time for the same application, basically just through an infrastructure upgrade, corresponding build setups, ideally some deployment and platform arrangements for it as well. It doesn't come for free. It certainly isn't a free lunch, but it comes as an option for existing applications where at re with reasonable effort, um, you could try to move an existing system, an existing application into that direction. All right, that's all we had for you today. Thanks for your attention. Um, there's plenty more in Spring Framework 6.1 and Spring Boot 3.2, a lot of goodness uh, that comes your way in uh, mid-November. So please upgrade to it. <laughs> try the release candidates. Uh, let us know how it goes. Um, and if there are any questions around the topics we've presented today in particular, we're here to um, discuss them with you. Please just join us here on the stage as we, as we wrap up. Thank you.